a highly beloved actor passes away. A video game movie taking over the box office. Apple having their very own primetime MacBook event. Artists attempting to poison the data that AI takes from them. The United Kingdom sending in a controversial online bill. Twitch ditching the Switch. And an AI chief holding firm on an ambitious prediction. This and a whole lot more taking over the headlines of the past seven days. I'm Jason Griwa, and this is The Fresh Wire. Hey everyone, hope you're all doing well. Welcome back to another episode. It is, as the time I'm recording, 10.17 p.m. October 31st, 2023. Happy Halloween. Hope everyone that does something for Halloween enjoyed doing something. I helped give out candy, and just a few days prior, I went to a Halloween party and enjoyed it. But the party was not in the best mood because just a few hours beforehand, as I was uh, working at where I work, a local news station, uh, I got some very, very unfortunate news, and it's what we're starting it off with. Uh, beloved friends, star and actor Matthew Perry passed away at the age of 54, Saturday afternoon, reportedly. Authorities found him unresponsive at 4 p.m., in a hot tub at his Los Angeles home. No signs of foul play or drugs on the scene. And this was extremely, extremely devastating. Um, as a kid, when I put on Nickelodeon, maybe weekend night or weekday night or whatnot, didn't have to wake up too early, it would be Nick at night. And it would be either George Lopez or Friends. And I just... You know, nowadays it's seen as like a fantastic show to put on the background, you know, chill out a bit. But when I was a kid, it, Friends was on. I'd watch it. I couldn't like keep my eyes away from it. And it was it was all of the people that were on screen. But the one that really did stick out was Chandler Bing, which was the character Matthew Perry played. And I liked it as a kid. I stuck with it. First thing I saw when uh, we got, when it arrived on... HBO Max or Max, whatever it is now, I watched an episode of Friends. It was a fantastic show. I obviously did not grow up to see it air new episodes, but it was fantastic. Um, and finding out that he passed away was genuinely devastating. It made me see a lot more into his history, that he used to have problems with um, drugs and alcohol, but it was just recently that he was able to overcome all of it, and it seemed like he was finally in the clear. They just had a reunion of the Friends cast in 2021, and he released a memoir late last year, and it received a lot of uh, good, good response. A lot of people liked reading it, saw an up-close look into, you know, who he was and how he got to where he is now, sober. Um, but he has now passed away. A lot of tributes came out, and it was very, very sad. Um, there's no other way to put it because, you know, he had a huge career. He, I think he starred in something in 1979 or so, late 70s, and then into the 80s, and then got onto Friends for 10 years. Every episode he took part in, he had key roles as a guest uh, guest actor in some other shows, including The West Wing, and you know tried to be in a few new shows as the main character. Uh, Go On uh, is one that sticks to me, and yeah, it's it's absolutely devastating. Um, he did not marry or have kids, so as of now. Um, his survivors is he survived by his parents, both I think are still alive, and his uh, siblings or half siblings. So, extremely, extremely sad. But, sorry, not nineteen, uh, not nineteen seventy nine. But he, he, it was the mid to late eighties that he was very active, and then he got into friends, and the rest was history. So, extraordinarily sad, in it, uh, sad, and. 
he will absolutely be missed. And I definitely plan to do a very lengthy Friends Marathon. I saw a few episodes recently, and it's just, you know, it's emotional now. Uh, seeing the, op- uh, now a pop-up at the beginning of a season, you know, in memory of Matthew Perry, he will deeply, deeply be missed. He already has. He already is. And it's very sad. Um, sticking with entertainment, seems like every every podcast, I gotta cover it, because there's always something happening. And, you know what? The strikes don't let me down, because there's always something to cover. Uh, Earlier today, an article on Variety shows that uh, SAG-AFTRA is, is going to meet with Hollywood Studios again tomorrow, Wednesday, after another, quote, productive day of talks. It's now day 110. Uh, the sides continue to project, quote, cautious optimism, unquote, about resolving the strike. The studios have warned that they must get a deal this week in order to be able to produce partial seasons of scripted network TV series. So that's... So if something doesn't happen now, we really are going to see big changes uh, in the future on local television and, you know, movies in general. You know, I mean, as we consistently have been seeing movies being delayed and whatnot. Um, this is from the article uh, that the union continues to bargain over the use of AI, one of the key remaining issues. The union is seeking, uh, not seeking for forbids studios from using AI to create, quote, digital doubles, but does want language guaranteeing consent and minimum compensation for such use. The union has also sought to restrict AI training on past work and asked for a provision giving the union a veto over AI uses. Uh, Once again, four studio CEOs who have been in the room before, the CEO for Warner Bros. Discovery, Netflix, NBC Universal, and Disney, did not participate in the talks today, and they have not been at the negotiating table since Thursday last week, leaving the bargaining again to the CEO of the pretty much the group of Hollywood Studios, the AMPTP, uh, the CEO, and her staff. So tomorrow being the 111th day, SEGAFTRA will hold a, quote, unity picket at Disney's headquarters in Burbank, California, and that picketing at other locations in L.A. will be canceled for the day. Monday night, SEGAFTRA's negotiating committee said the recent talks had been productive, but that the two sides remain, quote, far apart on key issues. So I don't know if what will come out of tomorrow will mean a whole lot. I mean, they're saying that today was productive and that there is cautious optimism, and it seems like maybe the studios will be a little more willing to end this, mainly because if it's not this week, partial seasons of scripted shows will not be able to arrive on time partial seasons so it's already there are some episodes that just won't happen like these are going to be shorter seasons um but no idea genuinely don't know maybe one day i will stop talking about hollywood strikes i feel like it's going to happen it's going to happen i mean it has to i don't see this you know they're not gonna i don't want to jinx it but i don't think they're gonna lay off all the actors that are currently in um (laughs) The union. I, I don't think there's going to be any sort of historic change like that. It it would be ridiculous. It would be unprecedented, and it would not end well for literally anyone, which is why it hasn't happened. And I don't anticipate it to. It would be unbelievable. What's not as unbelievable, but still can be, depending on your take on how streaming services has affected the movie industry in general, but recently, the film Five Nights at Freddy's, can't believe I'm saying that, had a very big opening weekend. $80 million in its domestic box office. Um, now, this film, Five Nights at Freddy's, has not been very well received to critics. I think it was like in the 20s. It's percentage on Rotten Tomatoes, but audiences have absolutely loved it. Now, I have yet to see it. Uh, I'm probably going to end up seeing it later this week on Peacock. I don't really have a group I group plan to see it with friends um, in theaters, so that's not going to happen. But maybe I may be watching Five Nights at Freddy's. I mean, I, I, I never really got into playing it, but I definitely watched YouTubers play it as it was new. I was like a teenager, so I was like the prime audience at the time. I feel like the audience has now gotten younger. I don't know how that happened. Um, there's probably a good explanation. 
but this film is PG thirteen. You know, it's not like gory. Uh, I've heard someone say uh, that worked on the film that they're not gonna do an R rating cut or anything like that. It was meant to be PG thirteen. This the box office eighty million dollars has tied uh, Marvel's Black Widow for biggest release in theaters and streaming. In twenty twenty one, Disney released Black Widow on both theaters and as a streaming release on Disney Plus. However, this is pretty impressive because Black Widow costed an extra $30 to rent on top of having a Disney Plus subscription. It wasn't the first movie. I think Mulan was the first movie where it was released on Disney Plus, but you had to pay extra on top of having Disney Plus. And then a few months later, it would release on Disney Plus as part of its subscription. But this was also 2021, so a lot more people may have been willing to watch Black Widow pay the 30 bucks on Disney Plus, uh, or rather, more people were willing to risk it, risk getting COVID-19, and go to a theater during 2021. I think it was mid-2021. Great time, said very few people. Um, but now, you know, things have returned to mostly normal. So Five Nights at Freddy's being this successful with knowing it's on Peacock without any extra cost. You just get a subscription of Peacock and watch Five Nights at Freddy's for, in some areas in the country of the U.S., probably cheaper than seeing it in theaters, which is horrible. But it's interesting. I'm definitely going to check it out. Audiences love it. Critics don't. Nowadays, I find myself more as a lean toward the critics, but... I do have a more personal connection with Five Nights at Freddy's as I grew up watching YouTubers play the game through it all. So it's possible that this may be one of the rare times I stick with the audience in favoriting how the movie is. What I did not, but it seems like, and what film that I think got both sides enjoying it, Killers of the Flower Moon I saw last week, absolutely fantastic. Turns out some theaters are breaking agreements on Killers of the Flower Moon. It's a very, very lengthy film, 206 minutes, over three hours. And I felt it, but I felt it in a good way. I liked how pretty much every minute was utilized, and I really didn't feel like the movie was too slow. I felt like it was just great. It really was just great. It's probably going to win at least one Oscar, maybe two. However, some theaters disagreed with its length being okay, and ended up inserting their own intervals, their intermissions between uh, halves of the film, ranging uh, scene ranging from 6 to 15 minutes as of Friday morning last week. Two European cinema chains and one independent theater in Amsterdam, Amsterdam sold tickets with a built-in break. A spokesperson for UCI Cinemas, an exhibition uh, chain with venues in Germany, Italy, Portugal, and Brazil confirmed all of its nearly 80 theaters had included a six-minute interval, quote, six-minute interval towards the middle of the film. So while it's only a very small amount of venues out of the roughly 10,000 global, globally screening the film, it has been noticed. And it is curious. It's going to be interesting how it's going to... Uh, if they're going to get reprimanded for the situation. Domestically, a theater in Colorado, The Lyric, showed uh, the historical drama with an intermission as well for its first few days. However, after getting in trouble with Paramount and Apple Original Films, they did away with it. The companies have been contacting theaters that have violated the contract by splitting up the film and telling them to show, quote, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon as intended, according to an individual with knowledge of the situation. This is from an article uh, by Variety. So, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, it's tough to get through a film that's over three hours. We're, I feel like people are starting to get used to it a little bit more ever since Avengers did it so successfully with Avengers Endgame being just over three hours. But now, you know, films continue to get even longer, and when films were around this length, you know, a few decades ago, intermissions were actually pretty common when they exceeded three hours. But now, films have been built to kind of feel like that it's okay for them to be this length all in one go. And it's, uh, you know, if, if the director didn't intend for an intermission, there shouldn't be an intermission. I do see why people are, you know, 
a little tougher to get through films that are nearing three and a half hours. But come on, when the film is this good, you got to prepare. You know, if you feel like at any opportunity you got to use the restroom, use that restroom. That's what I did. I didn't feel like I had to go, but I knew I had to go at some point. So I did use the restroom before watching the film, and I think I had to use it right after because I drink a lot of water. When I'm not letting the theater get me in terms of those uh, concessions, but it was, it was quite something. Great film. So now that was the entertainment section, a bit longer than usual because of the passing of Matthew Perry. We're going to get into entertainment and a well, entertainment. We're going to get into technology, and there has been a whole lot. And now, normally I would start with the big one, which is Apple. Apple, Apple, Apple. But I do want to get on a little things that happened not too long after I recorded my podcast. For example, Google Fiber, sometimes called G Fiber, is starting to work on 20 gigabit speeds utilizing the new Wi-Fi 7 standard, which has not been certified yet. It's still being finalized. But we are starting to see routers using Wi-Fi 7, and it's looking like Google wants to get right to the jump and offer 20 gigabit. I don't know if you've been seeing commercials on TV, but as you probably have, Xfinity, you know, really touting its 10G network, where I don't even think they're offering 10 gigabit now, but the network they're building up, oh, there's going to be 10 gigabit. This network is capable of 10 gigabit. Where you get anywhere near 10 gigabit, well, you're lucky to get t over 10 megabit. You can thank ISPs for their incredible lobbying, but that's political. 20 gigabits per second Google Fiber is aiming for. I don't think anyone's close to that. I know AT&T and Xfinity are like 5, 6, uh, maybe a little higher in experiments. I have 2 gigabit and it is more than enough. I'm actually thinking about downgrading from it. It's been great, but it is a lot. It is definitely a lot. Um, and 20, I can't imagine 10 times the speed that I have now. It would be ridiculous. It would. I think my hardware would be bottlenecked. And I have pretty good hardware. So that'd be crazy. But... Google Fiber currently offering 8 gigabits per second, you know, 20 being over double. It would be incredible. Last week, I talked about how Avermedia is introducing new capture cards that utilize HDMI 2.1 standards, specifically, you know, 4K at high refresh rates. Normally, you'd see 60 hertz in, like, uh, maybe TV shows or some video games, but some are reaching 120 hertz. Well... That's what the new standard was for. That's what the new capture cards were for. Elgato is a very well-known competitor to Aver Media. Usually Elgato is the more recognized one with their capture cards and other hardware. They're more well-known. Elgato just recently teased two new capture cards at TwitchCon that are running HDMI 2.1, specifically one that is a USB capture card, so an external one that you can unplug and plug into your laptop or a computer, Capable of 4K, 144 hertz pass-through, which I think the Aver Media one is as well. Along with a capture card that runs on the PCIe standard, which is really you're able to plug it directly into a port in your computer, like a graphics card. Th that one specifically can handle 8K, 60 hertz pass-through, uh, pass which is obviously very impressive. As of now, I don't think any of the video game consoles can output 8K. I think the PlayStation uh, PlayStation 5 box says 8K right on it, but I think even to now, nearly three years after release, you still can't output 8K anything. So these are cool. Uh, competition is usually great. Uh, Algado has not confirmed pricing or release date. So just keep that in mind. Uh, another thing that happened early on after my podcast was yet another price hike. Let's go. Another price hike. And it's Apple this time. Apple has finally joined in. They are giving out price hikes and increases in costs across the board. Um, so Apple TV Plus, which costs $6.99, actually pretty low compared to a lot of other options, knowing that I don't think they have ads on theirs. Now it's going up to $9.99. There you go. Apple Arcade, going from $4.99 to $6.99. Apple Arcade was kind of like a subscription service for your Apple devices where you could play a bunch of different games that I think are, for the most part at least, exclusively available on Apple Arcade. They had games that you could only play through their monthly subscription service. Great for preservation. Sarcastically. 
So now that's going to go up. Meanwhile, Apple News Plus, I think that's like Apple News Plus. It's a group of, it seems like articles that you're able to read, I guess, without ads or without subscription services, added on premium content from local, national, international newspapers. So I guess it's a good thing to support your local journalism and maybe national ones as well, all under one app or service. That used to cost nine ninety nine a month. Now it's twelve ninety nine a month. And if you had the Apple One bundle, which included a bunch of these services all together under one subscription, kind of like I think Google One. That's what I have because I don't have Apple stuff except the iPod Touch, RIP. So the Apple One bundle will also go up as well. If it was by yourself, the individual bundle is going up three bucks. Actually, they're, the family one's going up three bucks, and the Premier one is going up five dollars, thirty-seven ninety-five. I guess the Premier one has all of the services rather than maybe just a select few. Okay, Premier Plan inclu- includes Fitness Plus and the News Plus subscriptions, which went up along with two terabytes of iCloud Plus storage. Thirty-eight bucks for all that sounds like a lot. I just pay a hundred a year. For two ter- uh, actually, for two terabytes of storage and a bunch of other stuff. So, huh. An actual Apple spokesperson confirmed the changes and that existing subscribers will see the price increase go into effect 30 days later on their next renewal date. Apple also says they're rising prices in select international markets. Huh. So, not great. Uh, not great news. You know, price hikes are always lovely for people that, you know, love saving money. But in the in the case of Apple, they don't really have like a lower plan because all their plans were already equivalent to like the cheaper tiers from other services. Six ninety nine, for example, that's like around the price of Disney Plus's ad supported tier and Netflix's ad supported tier. And now Apple says, "All right, if you want this, it's ten bucks now." Unfortunate, but I that is one of the few services I don't have. Apple TV Plus didn't really need it, um, but yeah, sorry for all the people that do. Have it sucks. Um, what sucks for AI is what Nightshade, a new tool that allows users to attach itself to their creative work, and it will corrupt or poison training data using that art. So artists are really pushing forward on getting AI to stop using their art, or if it's not, the AI gets punished. Eventually, it can theoretically ruin future models of AI art pl- pro- platforms like DALI, Stable Diffusion, and Mid Journey. What Nightshade does is invisible changes to pixels in a piece of digital art. When the art is ingested, the quote poison exploits a security vulnerability that confuses the model, so it will no longer read an image of a car as a car and come up with a cow instead. Sounds like something that will probably get fixed. Um, not gonna lie, but Nightshade's creators propose in this paper that the tool and similar one should be used as a quote, last defense for content creators against web scrapers that do not recognize opt-out rules. So, interesting stuff. I mean, it continues to be that AI-generated content continues to be a gray area for copyright issues. Lawsuits have started popping up against generative AI platforms. Google and Microsoft have said they're willing to take the legal heat if some customers are sued for copyright infringement while using their products. However, the majority of these products are text-based. And I know it's... I know copyright problem remains. It wasn't that long ago that I, for fun, asked uh, Bing AI, which utilizes DALI 3, recently released image generator, to create some things that did involve copyright characters just to see if it worked, and it worked beautifully. I don't know if it's changed since then. It was about a few weeks ago that I tested it out, right around when Dolly 3 was implemented into Bing AI. And it worked extraordinarily well. I didn't, like, post it or anything, but it was scary good. So I definitely see why artists and uh, are trying to push back on it, understandably, and that copyright infringement lawsuits are starting to pop up. Good that Google and Microsoft are willing to take the heat for people if they get screwed over. But that just shows that the terms and use of these AI creation platforms is more lax than anticipated. I'm surprised there's not something in these terms of conditions, unless there already is, where it says, um, 
you know, anything you make here, it's your responsibility. Maybe Google, Microsoft forgot to put that in or something and are now willing to take the heat. Interesting. I'm surprised they didn't say from the beginning you can't use these for commercial purposes. But, hmm. Uh, speaking of generative AI, Amazon. Hey, that's a name I don't really say much in the podcast. So Amazon is now letting advertisers use generative AI to pretty up their product shots. Reading an article from The Verge, Amazon seems to be beta testing AI image generation tools for its advertisers. The company is saying the new feature is, quote, designed to remove creative barriers and enable brands to produce lifestyle imagery that helps improve their ads performance. Hmm. So it looks like if the example image seems to be that there's a toaster which is existing in the blank space. Um, they will not write your name. Blank space of just pure white. And then it's just turned into that it's now in like a backdrop, someone's kitchen, some wood grain, some weird looking food nearby, a fork that just looks very little morphed, but also why is there a fork close to the toaster? It seemed to put that in for some reason. Backdrop seemed to be pretty good from the few I'm looking at. And it works just like any other tool. You enter prompt, and it gives you multiple results. So, yeah. it You know, the fork, not that great. But, you know, it's the small details. The fact that it's the small details that seem to have the problems is scarier than cooler. So the Amazon CEO, Andy J JC, J A S S Y, has stated that every, quote, every single team at his company is exploring and working with generative AI. Quote, it is going to be at the heart of what we do. It is, it's a significant investment and focus for us, he said on Amazon's quarter two 2023 earnings call. Cool stuff. Uh, cool stuff, but also, you know, it's going to be funny, like, pointing out every now and then, oh, this was AI generated when you see a fork looking a little morphed and also a fork being close to a toaster. Probably not what advertisers want seen in their ads for products, hoping to make a quick buck. What Apple seems to be not wanting to make such a quick buck, but also a very hefty buck, last night they had their, quote, scary fast Mac launch event, unveiling a few new MacBooks and a new iMac utilizing a brand new processor, the Apple M3. It was a very Mac-heavy product launch event and some very good things that came out of it, but also one massive glaring issue. But we'll get to that later. The M3 chips were unveiled. It was the M3, the M3 Pro, and the M3 Max. Apple says this marks the, quote, first personal computer chips made using the more efficient 3 nanometer process. If you don't know 3, ma then, uh, three nanometer, it means s smaller number it can theoretically be more efficient and more capable to fit more into a smaller space. For example, there was 28 nanometer, 14 nanometer, 7, 5. You might have, your smartphone may have a processor that's 7 or 5 nanometer. Maybe soon your smartphone will have 3 nanometer. But now this is the first time a mass market, I think mass market will have 3 nanometer processors fantastic you know this allows it to have a faster more efficient cpu a new and improved gpu that features crazy improvements and is capable of a lot of ram the m3 chips offer up to 120 gigabytes of unified memory unified being that it is etched pretty much into the system on a chip rather than it being like replaceable and more high-end gaming computers and laptops desktops in general have RAM you can put in and take out, but laptops, it's been a little trickier because they have to be thinner and lighter. Gaming laptops, you're able to swap in and out, sometimes with the RAM, but to unify things and keep things tightly integrated, that has not been the case with Apple's processors, and it looks to be no different with the M3. So if you know you want more than 8 gigabytes of RAM, you better pay to pony up some cash, and I'll explain how bad it is later. But the iMac has been refreshed, the 24-inch one specifically, with the M3 chip. It starts at $1299, or if you want a beefier CPU, it's going to be an extra $200, and it'll be available starting November 7th. You can pre-order today. The MacBook Pros, 14 and 16-inch, also get a very, very healthy boost in capability. 
Both laptops feature the mini LED display. I think I read somewhere that they're also high refresh rate. They feature a nice camera, improved, I guess, sound system, and of course the capability of up to 128 gigabytes of RAM. They have a new space black finish, which looks like matte black, and it genuinely looks really nice. I can imagine MKBHD will be absolutely loving it. I think he said somewhere that it is tempting, which for him shouldn't be, because he's currently using an older MacBook Pro that is already fantastic. But I can imagine this will be a selling point for people with a lot of dough to burn. The 14-inch MacBook Pro with the M3 Pro starts at 2000 The 16-inch starts at 2400 And there will also be a cheaper 14-inch MacBook Pro that includes the normal M3 chip starting at $1,600. It replaces the 13-inch MacBook Pro that had an M2 chip, and as a result, that does mean a uh, goodbye 13-inch MacBook Pro. Now, your only option is 14 or 16-inch, I think. And yeah, that means the touch bar that has been that were in a lot of MacBooks at one point has been now completely taken out. Physical keys have fully returned to all models. Keeping in mind, it does feature 8 gigabytes of RAM, and I have to say, keep in mind, you cannot upgrade the RAM afterward because it's so tightly integrated and pretty much built into the system itself there's no way to upgrade it there's no way to replace it eight gigabytes of ram in 2023 entering 2024 is in my opinion uh not good it is really really bad um minimum should be 16 gigabytes of ram my laptop has 64 that was upgradable and because laptop ram for older computers has gotten so much cheaper but you don't want to stick with 8GB for the duration of your laptop, especially when MacBook Pros are able to last as long as they do. That 8GB is going to fill up quick. If you're interested in multitasking at all, don't do 8GB. And it sucks because 16 is going to cost more. Um, and I actually don't know if you can even upgrade this one. If you're going to upgrade to 16, I think the other ones... I mean, you just... If you see 8 gigabytes of RAM, just pretend it's not an option. Which, you know, if it means the more expensive one is out of your budget, then Windows laptops in that price range have gotten fantastic. Maybe not to every degree that the MacBook Pros are, especially not the M3. But, you know, you can't... It, it's it's tough to, like, spend that much on a laptop. Like, I don't know. It's just that's, that's, that's crazy to me. Um, and what's really crazy is how much the most expensive MacBook Pro you can buy. If you load up the 16-inch MacBook Pro with 120 gigabytes of RAM and an 8 terabyte SSD and the more powerful M3 processor, which I think was called the M3 Max, not the Ultra. There's no M2. There's no M3 Ultra just yet, but it's the M3 Max. If you put all of that in, a beautiful little computer costs you a whopping $7,200. $7,200. For a laptop, um, and what's funny is the screenshot shows. Oh, don't worry. For you, if you you can have the option of paying for it over twelve months, almost six hundred dollars. That's more than a car payment for like a Toyota Corolla with an okay down payment, but it's for a laptop over the span of a year. Seventy two hundred dollars. That is insane. The people that need those sort of computers, man, I hope it's covered. Because I can't imagine, you know, I mean, and keep in mind, storage, also not upgradable. So if you know you want more than the default storage, which I think nowadays is 512 gigabytes, not terrible. But if you're in the market for a MacBook Pro, you probably want a lot of storage. And you're going to probably run through that 512 gig very quickly. Um, but yeah, oof, crazy stuff. But I'm glad they are moving forward with making their laptops even better. One thing I also saw that was interesting in the event was that they kept comparing mainly Intel MacBook Pros and the M1 MacBook Pro or MacBook models and iMac because it's not likely you're going to go from the M2 to the M3. You know, very few people I can imagine upgrade from Intel's 10th generation processor to its 11th generation processor. While there are notice consistent improvements with Apple unlike how uh, unlike some years that Intel did not improve meaningfully their processors year after year, these are still extremely expensive laptops and trade-in values I can imagine aren't as great as comparing like trading in your phone to the next one. Um, but something that is pretty ridiculous is 
Just earlier this year, when Apple introduced the iPhone 15 models, it introduced the new USB Type-C port, something that Android users have uh, fallen in love with for, wow, six years at least? I think it's six years, if not more. Um, they finally went over to the side of USB Type-C, mainly because the, the European Union introducing legislation to require that port in phones at a certain point, I think next year. Well, bec it seems like that was not mandated with accessories because the iMac, as cool as it is with the brand new processor, its keyboard, trackpad, and mouse still use lightning ports, which means these, and I think the AirPod Maxes, which are Apple's uber high-end headphones, are the only things I can think of that have the old AF lightning ports. And because of the Magic Mouse with its ridiculous positioning for its port, that does mean in 2023 you can get a brand new iMac that costs $1,300 and still have to charge your mouse from the bottom. Wow, what a world. That sounds genuinely horrific. Um, meanwhile... There are some manufacturers for Windows mice where you can have the <laughs> you can have the mouse charged just by having it on the the mouse pad. That's ridiculous. I don't know. Sometimes Apple loves to innovate and then forgets that they have products that desperately need innovation. Um but this this one I'm about to talk about is actually pretty crazy. Um uh, the Beatles has one last song coming out. The Beatles, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Ringo Starr. There was a song that they all worked on that never saw the light of day and with the power of AI is finally going to be released. Were it not for machine-assisted learning tech by Wingnut Films, Peter Jackson's 2021 film The Beatles Get Back might not have... Oh, sorry, docuseries might not exist the way it does today. With that same AI... The Beatles' final song will finally be available for the first time. It's called Now and Then. It's the last Beatles song. And there will also be released a 12-minute long documentary about the song's production from director Oliver Murray. McCartney, in a press release, described becoming, quote, quite emotional over hearing Lennon's voice on a genuine Beatles recording in 2023, and Ringo Starr, the other surviving Beatles member, described the process of producing the song as, quote, the closest we'll ever come to having Lennon, but he didn't say Lennon, back in the room. Now and then will be available also as a double A-side vinyl with Love Me Do, which was the Beatles' first song. Now and then debuts, the documentary debuts tomorrow, November 1st, and now and then the song will drop the following day. The song's music video will drop the third. So November 1st, the documentary, the song Thursday, and the music video Friday. Good stuff. I will absolutely listen to it the moment it comes out. I will definitely watch the documentary as well. Very interested in that. I like a lot of the Beatles music, and I'm glad that a new song coming out of it, I mean, it's decades. That's like decades. They broke up like, what, 1970? It's like 50 years. It's incredible. Um, but what's not incredible, and I definitely will be checking out that song. Maybe I'll talk about it in the next podcast. But what's not incredible is what finally became law, mainly of its controversy. Uh, in the United Kingdom, they passed the online safety bill. Now, I think I talked about this in an earlier episode. It aims to make the country, the UK, quote, the safest place in the world to be online, unquote. It received royal assent today and has become law. It's been years in the making and introduces new obligations for how tech firms should design, operate, and moderate their platforms. Specific harms the bill aims to address include underage access to online pornography, quote, anonymous trolls, scam ads, the non-consensual sharing of intimate defakes, and the spread of child sexual abuse material and terrorism-related content. That does mean pl online platforms don't have to immediately comply with all the duties. Um, however, uh, UK telecoms regulator Avcom, in charge of enforcing the rules, 
plans to publish its codes of practice in three phases, the first covering how platforms will have to respond to illegal content like terrorism and child sexual, I was just say CSAM, and a con consultation with proposals on how to handle these due to be published on November 9th. Phases two and three cover platforms' obligations around child safety and preventing underage pornography access. Underage access to pornography, specifically. Um, and that will follow through next spring. Failure to comply could land companies with fines up to 18, around the U.S. equivalent of $22 million or 10% of their global annual turnover, whichever is higher. And their bosses could even face prison. So the online safety bill has been understandably controversial because there are platforms like WhatsApp and Signal that are end-to-end -end encrypted. So it's significantly more difficult for law enforcement and authorities to access messages because unless you have the phone itself that sent over that message, you can't really access it. Messaging apps like the two I mentioned objected to a clause in the bill that allows Ofcom to ask tech companies to identify CC uh, child sexual abuse content, quote, whether communicated publicly or privately, unquote, which the companies say fatally undermines their ability to provide end-to-end -end encryption. Providers of these services have suggested they'd rather leave the UK than comply with these rules. Now, WhatsApp is extraordinarily popular, Signal to a degree as well. It's only in the US that iMessage seems to be taking over everything, and if you don't have an iPhone, you are uh, objectively lame. Uh, I disagree. Unfortunately, the stats don't lie. Um, meanwhile, the Wikimedia Foundation, part of Wikipedia, has said that the bill's strict obligations for protecting children from inappropriate content could create issues for a service like Wikipedia, which chooses to collect minimal data on its users, including their ages. So, yeah, it's, uh, of course, it's controversial. How much it'll impact things over here is yet to be determined, whether or not something like this goes through. I think a bill similar to this one is attempting to make it through Congress in the U.S. and is receiving the very similar uh, criticism and uh, controversial responses as this did. The difference is there is so much chaos going on in Congress, uh, at least there was in the past several weeks, that something like this, <laughs> I mean, you never know what's going to happen nowadays, especially in Congress. So I don't know if some of this will get passed here. But the fact that some of this did get passed in the UK, now you never know. Um, and yeah, don't know what will happen here, but I will definitely keep my eye on it and see where it goes. If WhatsApp gets removed from the UK, I'll definitely talk about it. Same for Signal. I have both services. I mainly use WhatsApp, but I've used Signal before just to try it out um, to find out a few friends use it as well, just so they could try it out as well. So um, that's definitely something I'll keep an eye on. What's something that I have also been keeping an eye on is the chaos and insanity surrounding x slash twitter.com. You know, the lovely little platform that Elon Musk paid for, you know, just a small little $44 billion just about a year ago from today. Well, it has been about a year and Elon Musk has given it a new evaluation of $19 billion. Does it sound like a lot? For some people, absolutely. For Elon, for Elon Musk, he wishes it was larger. 55% drop, Elon Musk thinks the company has went through. And that is because employees at the company were awarded equity in the company at a valuation of $19 billion, or $45 per share. It's noted that, quote, the fair market value per share is determined by the board of directors based on a number of factors in a manner that complies with applicable tax rules, unquote. A little tidbit by this article on The Verge. Musk is X's chair and has yet to create a formal board. So I have no idea how he calculated this. Um, yeah, so very interesting stuff. Fidelity earlier thought X slash Twitter.com is now worth 65% less than what it was originally bought at. That would imply between 15 to $16 billion or more accurately, or in a funnier way, an incineration of over $28 billion in enterprise value. That's incredible. That is genuinely jaw-dropping to lose what is an estimated $28 billion in value. My goodness. I don't even know how else to uh, react to that. How do you just... You, $28 billion gone in a year. 
don't even know how you could do that. That is that's a lot. I don't even I literally don't know how to comprehend that. It is difficult. Genuinely difficult. All right. Uh moving forward to things that have been more recently introduced. Uh, I think recently I talked about in an earlier episode that YouTube is cracking down more on ad blockers, and it seems like they're going forward, confirming that they have now launched, quote, launched a global effort. If you run into YouTube's block, you may now notice a something that says video playback is blocked unless YouTube is allow listed or the ad blocker is disabled. As I can see from this prompt, ad blockers violate YouTube's terms of service. You know, I mean, YouTube has a free platform, so ads allow it to continue to stick around. And if you want to be ad free, go for YouTube Premium. YouTube confirmed it was disabling videos for users with ad blockers back in June, but at the time said it was a quote small experiment globally. YouTube has now gone forward, and as more people have been seeing these ad blocker well blockers. Well, it's been confirmed that they're going forward and putting it out there even more so. So, for example, one staffer at The Verge says YouTube now fully blocks them nearly every time. I haven't seen this happen. Um, you know, if you support a content creator, you know, you could turn off ad blocker and go for it or just get YouTube premium so you don't have to deal with that either way. Much better for if you watch YouTube on uh, your TV anyway. Um, but yeah, this is, you know, it, it, it's understandable that YouTube is starting to push forward with, uh, getting rid of ad blockers because I can imagine, I mean, at the end of the day, if they enforce this and it becomes virtually impossible for any ad blocker to get around it, um, which is easily, which I don't anticipate that being a problem for ad blockers. I think there already is a way to get around it through more deep dive means if you have a more sophisticated ad blocker. Um, but, you know, if this ends up being the case that you got to stick through the ads, I don't see people having an alternative. I mean, there's Vimeo. That's it. I can't think of another alternative to YouTube. And the alternative to YouTube barely has anything that is on YouTube or Daily Motion, if that's still around. So, I don't know. I mean, I think people are going to fight to the end on getting their ad bloggers to continue working. But if, you know, if the, at the end of the day, it is obviously more likely that YouTube wins rather than the people. Um, I don't see YouTube giving in and saying, all right, fine, we're losing enough people. That's not going to happen. Too many people will rely on YouTube because it's such a monopoly platform for video sharing because of the fact it's so free. So... It could be the beginning of the end of using ad blockers for YouTube, but I have no idea. Um, I will definitely keep everyone updated. I haven't had the pop-up happen to me every now and then. I would have, uh, I would see if the pop-up would happen to me. You know, I'm occasionally seeing, oh, let me turn on my ad blocker to see if it pops up for YouTube, and I haven't seen it happen. So, while it's while they have said it's a global effort, I haven't seen it happen, as I've said now three times. And if it does, I'll mention it. What I probably wouldn't have mentioned if I didn't know about this was Twitch ditching the Switch. Twitch being a video game streaming platform that many, 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 many people around the world utilize for good reason. It is a fantastic, easy to use platform. I wouldn't say fantastic, but it's easy to use. And whether or not you get people is completely irrelevant <laughs> because... That's a whole other problem in of itself. But it's, you know, Twitch, you can set up live stream and you can watch live streamers on a lot of different things. And it was one of the few apps that was actually on the Switch, the Nintendo Switch. And I didn't even know about it. I don't even think I have it installed on mine. Uh, Twitch launched the Switch app in late 2021, but there were complaints with the app for a while. Specifically, that you weren't able to see a streams chat, which probably explains why I never use this, because that's part of the experience. If I'm not going to watch, and if I'm going to watch a stream without a chat, I would watch YouTube. Okay, that's a little bit of a burn. I'm a huge fan of Ludwig, who is currently a YouTube streamer and, you know, great content, although he sports the Buffalo Bills. Ugh, come on. The Miami Dolphins are right there. He used to support the Patriots, but I guess because Tom Brady left, the Patriots have become a much worse team, objectively. Dolphins just destroyed them, uh, and we beat them now twice a season. 
Let's go, Dolphins. Play the Kansas City Chiefs Sunday. I fear. I fear. That's all I'll say. But that wasn't the only problem. Uh, you also couldn't subscribe to creators if you wanted to support them subscribing. Not like subscribing on YouTube, but subscribing that you can give them a monthly amount of money in exchange for maybe emotes, possibly an ad-free experience, or you know other benefits that may arise. You also couldn't use the app to broadcast your own gameplay. Back in the day of the Xbox One, you had to have the Twitch app and start your live stream in the Twitch app. I remember doing this once because Mixer shut down for the Xbox One. Back in the heyday, several years ago, Mixer was a competitor to Twitch owned by Microsoft, bought by Microsoft, and eventually was shut down because they couldn't compete. They were giving millions of dollars to content creators, and they just couldn't, couldn't keep up. Somehow, Facebook Gaming was not doing that <laughs> that bad compared to Mixer. I don't even know if Facebook Gaming still a thing, but that's irrelevant, objectively, usually. So that was how it was, but with the Switch, there's no way to live stream from the Nintendo Switch. It just didn't really have the hardware. You were able to take screenshots at launch, and then at some point later, you were able to start, you were able to record the past three seasons as a clip. Meanwhile, on my PlayStation 5, I can record the past hour, start a live stream, start a recording, all built into the UI. And I think that was the case for the PS4 as well. And I think that's how it is now for the Xbox Series consoles. I don't own one, specifically the Series X, so I don't know. But that is how it is for the PS5, and I think this was for PS4. And the Switch, I guess, just didn't have the hardware. But Twitch is now saying that they're pulling the plug on the Switch app saying that the company is, quote, ending support for the app, according to a support page. They'll be removing the app from the e Nintendo eShop, which is equivalent to the PlayStation Store, on November 6th, and people who have already downloaded will, quote, lose access January 31st, 2024. So, I saw one person infamously comparing this, for some reason, to Reddit, which I find funny. Reddit, what they did was effectively make it impossible for third-party apps to exist on the Reddit and utilizing the Reddit platform without paying a hefty sum of money. As a result, nearly all of them were taken out like Order 66. And the current Reddit app is really not good, uh, in my opinion, for at least Android. I don't know about iPhone, but for Android, it just feels a bit buggy, doesn't load that well. And they've been making the mobile website version worse over time. Um, I don't know why one person compared it to that because the Switch does not have a web browser. <laughs> so once Switch loses Twitch, there will be no official way to watch Twitch unless you hack your Switch, which if you have an older model is entirely possible. Um, and I will not say how because it looks like Nintendo is getting a bit antsy with what they're doing with anything involving hacking their model. This, by the way, I wanted to mention on the subject of Nintendo... Last week, I mentioned that they had new content creating guidelines for their video games, and it did not look great because of how restrictive a lot of it was, especially with game preservationists pretty much getting screwed over and that they weren't allowed to like cover anything. But there was another thing that right after I published my episode, I looked into further, and it was genuinely jaw-dropping. It wasn't the only thing that they updated. The big thing for me was the content creating, but it was also that they were going a lot harder down on tournaments that involve Nintendo video games. Um, because of the rise of tournaments utilizing Super Smash Bros. Melee um, through online services, it seems like Nintendo wants to make sure if, if there's ever a tournament using our games, remember, it's copyright, and if you, you know, utilize a copyright in a way we don't like, we have the for some reason, right to completely destroy your life. Uh, and that's great. That is great, but not great at all. And I wanted to give my take that apparently it may not be as bad as anticipated because of the licensing licenses that could be provided, but it does look like Super Smash Bros. Melee. If you want to keep doing a tournament on that, it's going to have to be non-profit with, I think, a max of 200 people. It's going to have to be local using original hardware, original controllers, it pretty much awful. If you're going to do an online Nintendo Smash tournament, it's going to have to be, it seems, Ultimate. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate for the Switch. Maybe you can get a license and circumvent a lot of the things that Nintendo is enforcing for non-profit tournaments. But it does look like 
they really want to hone in if you and for there to be a large scale Smash tournament, Nintendo wants to be the one hosting it. And all the tiny ones where the people can't even make money off of it, they want that to be the community ones. Pretty much after some further digging, it doesn't look like it's the end of the world as anticipated. And again, if let's say I did this podcast Wednesday night, I absolutely would have covered this in length. But as it's now been a few days, it looks like it's died down a bit. And we're just going to have to wait a little longer on information on how Nintendo will go forward with it. It looks like there's already a way to apply for a license for tournaments in Japan. I have not checked if it's in, up in Europe. I don't think it's up in the U.S. yet. Once it is up in the U.S., I may check it out myself. I've participated in Super Smash Bros. tournaments before and have spectacularly failed in many of them. And the ones I did not fail in were because I played against my friends, who were also not that great, although they'll love to disagree. And, yeah... Not great. Not not good news. And a little small thing, because this hyped me up. Um, Apex Legends, which has... Um, it's like a battle royale shooting game that's available on a lot of different platforms. And I've been playing it since nearly day one, back in 2019. I had a few moments, a few months here and there, where I stopped playing to play like Overwatch or some other normal game. Well... They recently started a new season, and with it confirmed that cross-progression is finally coming to the game, which is which is fantastic. For people that play the game on more than one platform, this is great news. For example, if you played originally on PlayStation, whether with PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 together, it would sync with your PlayStation account and EA. So if you were to try to use the same account on maybe your Xbox or Nintendo Switch, it would be like starting over. You'd be back at level one. You couldn't play ranked for a while. All your skins and cosmetics wouldn't move with you, nor any characters. It was very annoying. And this is how it's been for, I guess, now nearly five years. It released, I think, January 2019. And they're now confirming, with the launch of their new season, which was earlier today, that they're going to start rolling out a phased approach to cross-progression. They're going to migrate accounts. There will be a migration period. And at a la- uh, at a cert- later date, it'll be automatic, and you'll be able to merge specific accounts. Now, what sucks is I think I have a lot of cool cool stuff on my Xbox One account, but I think it was linked to a different EA account because when I was younger, I may not have thought about keeping one EA account. I may have been younger and didn't know how that process worked, and I think EA was just like, all right, you play a PS3 game, here, here's an EA account, have fun with it. And because of how cross-progression kind of didn't exist before Fortnite, which was years ago now, wow, I feel old, and I'm not, (laughs) relatively. Um, But now, that seems to no longer be a problem, except for a few things. PlayStation, they've been the PS Plus pack items, those will remain exclusive on PlayStation, Xbox, same thing with their Xbox Founder stuff and Xbox Gold items. And Nintendo Switch, there was a... When that game launched on Nintendo Switch a while back, there was a legendary skin for one of the main characters, Pathfinder. That skin will remain exclusive for the Switch, I think because it's a red and white skin, so it's like Super Nintendo. Like, not Super... Like, not not SNES, but it's Super Nintendo-themed. Like, it's Nintendo-themed. You know, makes sense. It's why, like, in Rocket League, for example, there's Nintendo... There's Mario and Luigi cards, but when you play against other people and they're on, like, PlayStation, Xbox, or PC, they're not going to see those skins on that on those cards. They're going to see basic ones. So, good stuff. It looks like it's overall going to be pretty A-OK, and I look forward to how it is implemented. I'll finally be more willing... To, I think that means it even syncs PC and PlayStation, which is amazing. That means I could finally sync over all my stuff and not start from the very beginning playing Apex Legends on PC on my Steam Deck. It's on Steam Deck. It would be fantastic if I could start utilizing it there because I really don't want to start over, and I'm glad I didn't. So now I may start actually checking it out on the Switch. And definitely check in, checking it out on my Steam Deck, which is a PC-powered um, handheld. Pretty cool stuff. I recommend checking it out, the Steam Deck by Valve. What I don't recommend is what Xbox seems to be doing, but it is a little interesting, but I'll just explain what it is. 
Uh, with a new policy from Xbox, unofficial accessories running on Xbox consoles and platforms will no longer be possible. A new error will inform players their devices will be blocked. From November 12th, Microsoft will no longer allow unauthorized third-party accessories to be used with its Xbox consoles. Players have begun reporting a warning message displaying on their Xbox when doing so, notifying of the date their accessories will be blocked with a specific error. Then they're advised returning to return their accessory and refer to its list of authorized products on its website. Um, now, before I dive into this a little bit, there actually has been a spokesperson that talked about it from Microsoft yesterday, responding to questions by Windows Central on the new policy affecting certain manufacturers. Now, for context, it does seem to be that a lot of Xbox products have a design for Xbox or certified by Xbox. So it's always been the case. It's very likely that if you bought something that says Xbox or Microsoft on it, it probably had to be certified. And if you could just double check that before November 12th or whatnot. And if it is, you're good. So, yeah, or 17th. This article says November 12th. It should be the 12th. I'm not sure why it says here the 17th. So the statement by a Microsoft spokesperson is as followed. Quote, Microsoft and other licensed Xbox hardware partners, accessories are designed and manufactured with quality standards for performance, security, and safety. Unauthorized accessories can compromise the game experience on Xbox consoles. Players may receive a pop-up warning when their accessory is unauthorized. Eventually, the unauthorized accessory will be blocked from use to preserve the console gaming experience. Unquote. They later talk about what accessories are supported, the support pages, and the hardware program for designed by Xbox partners. There's no word on if controller spoofing my mouse and keyboard adapters like XIM and Cronus will be banned. Um, so it definitely seems like maybe cheaper products, cheaper third-party products that weren't certified, like maybe ones from Wish.com, Timu.com, the really cheap ones on Amazon, they might not be supported in a matter of two weeks. And it seems like some... Fighting sticks are also going to be affected. As seen here, the Wingman XP2 converter and XP fighting board by Brook Gaming, it seems like there will be functional disruptions in the near future. The they said in a statement, the Brook engineering team is fully committed to developing a solution to maintain product quality and functionality. So, hmm, it's going to be weird if... It's going to be very strange. It's unknown if Microsoft is doing this to push... They're more and they're designed for Xbox program, which are controllers, accessories. They may cost more than if they didn't have those certifications, or if it's to combat uh, adapters that allow you to plug in a mouse and keyboard into the Xbox, so you can have the advantages of mouse and key mouse and keyboard against console controller players. But it is completely unknown. Um, so, yeah, definitely double-check your accessories if you use an Xbox console, whether it's an Xbox One or Series console, and just double-check if it's certified. And if not, well, you've got 13 days to fix that because it's looking like it will stop functioning at one point or another. If you've been starting to get the error, then it may be you're already screwed. And because of the nature of online updates being so common for Xbox consoles, you're probably not going to be able to get around it unless you want to stop going online. Another thing that, uh, I don't know how else to get into this, but it is Microsoft-related. Um, <laughs> apparently, Microsoft's AI inserted a distasteful poll into a news report about a woman's death, the article being from The Guardian, and it talked about a woman that was found dead at a school in Australia and who they were. They were identified. <laughs> and the poll attached... Uh, looking at it is, yeah, it's awful. And I can definitely see why some people may have thought it was created by someone. And it is definitely an awful one. Um, the, the poll question is, what do you think is the reason behind the woman's death? And it gives three answers. And it is, that's something, yeah, this is obviously not something you're supposed to poll anyone because it's awful. You, you don't poll this to the reader. So in a statement, uh, Microsoft general manager said we have de Quote, we have deactivated Microsoft generated polls for all news articles, and we are investigating the cause of the inappropriate content. A poll should not have appeared alongside an article of this nature, and we are taking steps to help prevent this kind of error from reoccurring in the future. 
Uh, the Guardian also put out, uh, wrote a letter to Microsoft President Brad Smith that the, quote, clearly inappropriate, unquote, AI-generated poll had caused, quote, significant reputational damage, unquote, to both the outlet and its journalist, outlining, quote, the important role that a strong copyright framework plays, unquote, in giving journalists the ability to determine how their work is presented, asking Microsoft to make assurances it will seek the outlet's approval before using this sort of tech on its journalism. Yeah. Uh, very distasteful would not go far enough. That is awful. That is a generally awful poll to put on there. And yeah, th that should have definitely been looked at by a person before being put out there. Yeah, that's all I got to say about that. A little bit of VR stuff. Get into VR as we near the end of this incredibly lengthy podcast. I'm now looking at succeeding an hour and, a hour and eight minutes before I truncate silence and whatnot. Valve has officially launched Steam VR. 2.0. I talked about this in an earlier episode. That they were working on the beta for Steam VR 2.0. That was going to introduce a lot of cool features with Steam and virtual reality. And it looks like they have officially went forward. In a Steam post written by Valve, they say, quote, in this release, we're bringing all of what's new and exciting on the Steam platform into VR. This is our first big step in a larger ongoing effort to better unify the Steam ecosystem for all users, providing a more consistent experience across devices. It was back in 2019, Valve said that they were at hard at work on this massive update to Steam VR 2.0. Some of the things that were introduced include most of the current features of Steam and Steam Deck, now part of Steam VR, an updated keyboard with support for dual cursor typing, new languages, emojis, and themes, the integration of Steam Chat and Voice Chat, which I am very surprised was not part of the VR experience, an improved store putting new and popular VR releases front and center, and easy access to Steam notifications. No mention of any new hardware but it's rumored that they are working on some sort of new vr headset what it's going to be is unknown reportedly they've been developing a standard standalone one called codenamed deckard which if released would compete with meta's standalone headsets themselves and where that will go i would be extremely opinionated to talk about here but competition is usually good so I'm excited to see what Valve does with that. All right. So that's most of the podcast, but now time for Futurology, and I'll be a little brief. It is a double-decker, but I'll start with the uh, closer-term one. I love space travel. I love all about it. I love the telescopes that are out in, the, out in space looking over planets that may or may not have life on them. It's always exciting. But then there's also, you know, when are people going back to the moon? And... An astronaut for the Artemis II moon mission says the crew is ready for what's ambitious to be a 2024 mission. Jeremy Hansen, Canadian astronaut, is one of the mission, mission specialists aboard Artemis II, which aims to launch four people around the moon in 2024. This article written by Space.com. Uh, he'll make his first flight to space on a monumental effort. Artemis II, Artemis II plans to be the first astronaut mission to visit the moon in over 50 years kicking off human excursions for the larger Artemis program. The CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, selected Hansen in 2009, um, having to wait a bit because the contributions from Canada to space were modest compared to other agencies. But, you know, as it's been a while since, things seem to be gearing up, and I will be very excited for when this happens. I hope to see it live. Um... And, yeah, very curious stuff. I'm excited for it. Looks like they may be sticking with, as much as they can, the sort of ambitious goal of this launch being next year. And I will keep my eye on it for sure. What I'm also going to keep my eye on is how fast AI is growing. And that a Google co-founder, a co-founder of Google's DeepMind Artificial Intelligence Lab, over a decade ago, predicted that by 2028... AI will have a 50% ch uh, chance that they'll be uh, just or about as smart as humans. And more specifically, artificial general intelligence, which is a hypothetical thing where an AGI specifically could learn to accomplish any intellectual task that human beings or animals can perform. He, he made that bold prediction over a decade ago and holds firm on it in a tech uh, in an interview with tech podcaster Dwarkish Patel. 
The DeepMind co-founder Shane Legg said he still thinks researchers have a 50-50 chance of achieving artificial general intelligence, a stance he publicly announced at the very end of 2011 on his blog. He apparently looked toward the goal post all the way back in 2001 after reading a groundbreaking 1990 book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, that predicted a future of superhuman AIs. Uh, another person that advocated for AGI is OpenAI CEO Sam Altman. You know, OpenAI, the creators of ChatGPT. Um, and I think Dolly. So, yeah, that's very scary and absolutely possible. 50%, you know, coin flip on whether or not they can achieve that. And it could be more than a coin flip if uh, once it's past 2028. Now, of course, it remains to be seen if there's going to be any powerful legislation toward AI that happens in some countries or worldwide that could hinder the development of AI. So maybe this AGI uh, lofty claim might not happen or may it may well. No idea. But of course, we'll have to watch out for that. Uh, that sounds scary, though. You know, AGI artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, being as capable as people. That sounds generally terrifying, and the fact that it is more than possible by the end of this decade uh, will probably be very scary, will keep me up at night, maybe sometimes, but wow, things are looking very weird for AI, and I have no idea if it's a good thing or a bad thing. But as I explained through my whole podcast, AI has a lot of different paths to take, and it seems to be, rather than picking one, it's taking all of them. And I have no idea if that's going to be in anything, in any situation. It doesn't look like it's going to fail like Web3 or crypto, unfortunately, or NFTs did for the most part. So, yeah, as I said for 600 times in this podcast, I will keep my eye on it. A lot of things to keep an eye on. If you have any interest in the tech industry, wow, things are looking strange. And I miss Stranger Things. And that'll be it for me for this podcast. Wow, a very lengthy one. This is probably the longest podcast I have done yet. If you like this, I appreciate everyone that tunes in. And don't forget to check out my website, thefreshwire.com, where I'll be posting this up in the future. Maybe I'll allow comments for people. But in the meantime, you can always send in a voice message, and I'll listen to it over, maybe add it to a future podcast if it's good enough. And cover it in a few epi uh, future episode, whatever you want to talk about. Just let me know. I'm always willing to look into things other people may be interested in so that I can get a closer look and my own perspective on it. But until then, thank you all for listening and tuning in. I once more appreciate it, and I will catch you all around in the next one. Until then, take care of yourselves and have a good one. This has been The Fresh Wire with Jason Grewa. Have a good night, morning, evening, afternoon or day, wherever you are, wherever you live. Thank you, and have a good one. Peace.